I want to start on chapter nine, designing in 3D using corridors, and we're going to start to merge the last few chapters of topics we've learned from alignments to profiles, and we're going to merge them to make a backbone of a corridor into the next phase here. So really, when we're designing roads and other linear features, we have three stages. So whether it's a road, railroad, a canal for waterways and various linear features like that and civil design, we have an alignment, we have a profile, and we have a cross-section. And we have a little bit easier time in each of those different dimensions, horizontal, vertical, and then the cross-section, more of the Z dimension in an instance, thinking of the design in one dimension at a time rather than all three dimensions as it mentions here on the beginning of chapter nine on page 169. So the alignment profile stage is what we just covered. And now we're gonna add a third thing, the cross section, which is really what we're gonna learn is called the assembly. So we're gonna combine these elements together and make the 3D design process go up a notch in a dynamic three-dimensional model. So we're gonna start by learning about corridors and then we're gonna build and use our first assembly to go in said corridor. So for corridors, we need three things. We need an alignment, we need a profile, we need at least one assembly. And then we're gonna create our first corridor as the third item. Fourth item, we're gonna apply some corridor targets in a basic level to make our corridor do what we want to go to certain things in the horizontal, indoor, vertical. And the last area of this chapter, we're going to make some corridor surfaces. So our final thing at the end is a surface that is made with our alignment profile and assemblies mm -hmm. to make a linear feature more automated. So with that, let's go to Moodle, make sure you get your chapter nine uh, files in your homework and turn them here in Moodle. Um, our files are in here as usual, and there's 10 of, 10 of them, five complete, five not. So with that being said, let's start our files and we're gonna start with the creating assembly drawing here. I have all five open in order at the moment. So as you keep those open, open all five of them and I'll keep talking here a little bit more about, let me drag this over, corridors and what makes up a corridor. So between some of these images and your book here, let's talk about that a little bit. In the beginning of the chapter 171 through 172 have very good photos, very helpful to understand corridors. Uh, basically it consists of hundreds and thousands of civil 3D objects within the corridor that are very dynamically linked between each other with feature lines um, through points and codes and shapes, as we'll learn later. So a good way to understand them is they come together, uh, all these different components come together in what's called a 3D chain. So an alignment and profile combined form a three-dimensional pathway, as it says here, called a 3D chain. That is our, our basis, our our center line in, in some ways, or our backbone, better said, of our design for our corridor. So they can't be seen in our drawing easily, but for example, we, we can see them much easier if we go into a certain view, like this view down here. So once we make some corridors later in the chapter, they can be more easily seen in this 3D view here is what it's saying. Top view, you can see them as well, but they are more easily distinguishable in this 3D view. We can see how the chains work together. Here's your assembly, making feature lines in between, running the assembly along a corridor. Here's the assembly up here. This, uh, excuse me, alignment, and then it runs in its vertical along the profile. So we'll talk more about that later. This is just showing it a little more robustly in this view. So we're going back to the three panel views starting in chapter nine. This is a really helpful time to see them in three different views. You can see your top view of your alignments and profiles, your view of your assembly of interest and your 3D representation of it here. This is a really good time to experience the power of civil 3D using different views to connect what you see. It does bog down depending on what machine you have. Having all these views open, especially this view, you wanna be careful orbiting and moving around. It can really cause crashes sometimes. It's, it's more graphic intensive. So just keep that in mind. Um, going back to the book, this better shows this in a, in a more rendered state, but going on to an assembly. So an assembly is a backbone of a corridor. You need one to build one. It is a, is a representation of cross-sectional geometry of the 
exact feature you're designing. So a, a road, a canal, a railroad, it's very distinguished. So it's a typical cross-sectional of one area of, say, an asphalt road showing its curbs, what base materials are under it, what other things are next to it, like guardrails and sidewalks and cement and concrete. So this is a very good photo describing an assembly. An assembly is this icon essentially right here. It is the centerpiece of the assembly. So if I go to just pick one of these drawings in our upcoming lab, this is the assembly. And this is the assembly. When I pick it, its name here is called Subdivision Road. It is an assembly. And when I pick it, I have it picked here. Certain contextual ribbon things come up that we can do with this assembly and subassemblies and various other things. They also fall within our tool space. If I go back to Prospector, let's uh, cascade some of these down. I got five drawings open. Let's go to the one I'm in, which is this one. Uh, they fall under this area in our tool space. So this assembly is, is right here. And under it, it has a baseline. That's the center red thing I just clicked on. And then it has sub-assemblies within it. Uh, groups on each side of sub-assemblies with sub-assemblies underneath them. So um, assembly is made up of sub-assemblies underneath it. This would be a sub-assembly, this lane of road just to the right. This curb here is a sub-assembly, and sub-assemblies are generally made up of points. Um, those are more quickly called, yes, yeah, points. These are the actual points where the feature lines link between each assembly. Points, and then links, link points, so basically the line that draws between dot to dot, this dot, and this dot, and shapes. They make an overall polygonal shape, right? So this is, this subassembly is made up of points, lines which form sh points. Excuse me, points, links, and those links form a shape. And that is one subassembly within a major assembly here. So this is just one row cross sectional that does one exact thing. If this is linked to the alignment and profile, this is the exact shape over that region of the corridor. It will it will make it'll make this road linear shape. So that's a little further than we maybe needed to go, but it's important. This image shows it even better in a more bright setting. You can see we have grading here of a distance. Here's a sidewalk. Here's another little boulevard, a grayed out area on the uh, a sub assembly within this assembly. And then at the ends, it either cuts back up to a uh, cut slope to, to the earth or a fill slope going down to existing earth where you need to build up the road. Uh, in this case, you'd need to cut into the side of a mountain or a hill or whatever you want to call it, earth, earthwork. That is the cut slope. This is the fill slope. This is a daylight scenario. This is, you see these often, they can go either direction depending on if the ground is filling down or cutting going up. So a cut scenario or a fill scenario, fills are generally a shown as positive, cuts are negative, um, with a lot of mass grading we'll learn about later. And here is a better, even better picture that shows on page 171. Uh, here's a picture of the 3D chain. So this is, this blue line, let's say, is where our alignment and profile are. Our alignment is its horizontal, the profile is its vertical. They stay along that geometry in the vertical horizontal, and this chain of assemblies with sub-assemblies inside of it make up the corridor. So these are like the backbone. It looks like a big backbone here. This is a very good picture that depicts it. And this is the linear assembly that is over this given area of the corridor. So this is how this road, this linear feature is getting built. It looks exactly like this along this stretch of the corridor. So they're inserted at certain intervals along the 3D chain. This one, there may be spaced 10 feet. You can space them a foot apart. That makes it even tighter and more thick in a way of cross-sectional data. You can have them 25 feet apart. We'll see that in a little bit. So in between these 3D chains, or we have our alignment profile here running along this that the corridor follows, and we have our assemblies going a cross-sectional direction. So in the swath, a swath direction across the profile and alignment, where our profile and alignment are following it parallel this direction that my mouse is going. These are going in this direction, perpendicular to the profile and alignment. Let's say that's a better way of saying it. The assemblies are generally going perpendicular always to the, uh, the alignment and the profile. 
Okay, so think of them as perpendicular instantaneous views of your road or whatever feature you're making. So as we go down that chain, in between each assembly, which is on page 172, this really good photo is your feature lines linking between each code, those dots I showed you um, here on, let's go to a better drawing. These dots here I showed you between each code, these are linking from assembly to assembly along the 3D chain. These have to be labeled and well put together with it by a cab manager or some source so they can talk to each other, these codes between each assembly and they keep linking, basically forming this, look at it as it, and the book says it, you had your skeleton, your outer frame. Well, now you throw your fuselage, your outer hull or this is making a surface in this case, a civil 3D design surface of this linear feature road in this case. It's basically throwing a shell over the top of it. And these feature lines provide that. They're, they, they make brake lines along these assemblies as you go along the road profile and alignment. So these are the connecting pieces in between all the assemblies. So we're getting a little more advanced here. And which in the end, you can take those feature lines with, it, with your corridor and make a Corridor surface is how we want to end this chapter. We make the, the outer fuselage or shell of our surface. Uh, the surface itself, the outer casing, you can have different datums. You can have a subsurface, uh, different materials underneath, or the very top of the surface, the finished grade. You can do a variety of things like that. This is, let's say, just one of the surface datums, um, which create corridor surfaces which is the main goal in the end of, of this, is combining alignments, profiles, assemblies into corridors, and in the end, creating dynamic, adaptable surfaces is one major goal of this chapter and corridors in general. So we're gonna start with 9.1, creating an assembly, which is made up by sub-assemblies. Once again, we'll get into that in a second through 9.1. Let's go into 9.1 and begin that, creating an assembly drawing. So we're gonna start by going to the Home tab, and I'm in Civil 3D 2022 again, so we can try it. These are older files, a few years old, so if we, I might run into a couple uh, situations where I have a little trouble, uh, but I'll hopefully vet those out as I go. So we're gonna to go to Assembly. So most of my Civil 3D stuff right, is right in here, this area of my Home tab, okay. So we have Assemblies here. And we're going to say create assembly. And I'll hover on it for a minute. Inserts a baseline, which is the baseline assembly, which you attach your corridor sectional data components, aka subassemblies, as it says. Then we just when we define the ba assembly base point, we add the subassemblies to its base baseline. Hence building the assembly. So we're, let's let's do that. Pick that. And our dialog box enters here. We're going to call it subdivision road. And we're going to look at a couple other things. For code set style, this is how it appears. Um, we're going to pick all codes with hatching in step four. Right here. This is how the... Uh, Assemblies show graphically in general and the different types of assembly styles. We won't dabble into that. And this is all we're going to pick. There's some other layers. It has its default Civil 3D layer inside of Civil 3D. Um, it doesn't say anything about doing the type of road it is. This is something you might do a lot. You have different types of crowned roads with divided highways or lanes or not, or a railway. Uh, planar roads would be a cross slope road. It slopes only in one direction. A crowned road would be it slopes in two directions, but let's just leave that uh, as other. And let's go into this view and let's pick a spot. Uh, let's pick somewhere up here out of the way. We'll put our assembly right there. This is our beginning baseline part of our assembly. If we pick it, it says it's an assembly and also contextual ribbon, right? So I'll hit escape. <clears throat> and on the home tab, this is a new palette you might need to open back up. It's called tool palettes. If you don't have it open, it is right here. This turns it on and off. I'm not gonna turn mine off. Mine's already on, but I like to dock mine over here. It's called tool palettes. 
You have a variety of tabs here on the left-hand side. They can be customizable, changed very much so, but Civil 3D comes with certain baseline ones. So we're going to go to a certain one, and in the Tool Palettes window, we're going to right-click the gray strip labeled Tool Palettes, and we're going to go to the one we want. Um, and actually, let's go up here, the top one. I'm going to start by trying to right-click over here. And it wants us to select Civil Imperial Metric Subassemblies. So we have that already open. Okay. And this could be a little confusing, so let me try to piece into this a little bit. Um, I have a bunch of assembly options here, or tool palettes. I'm trying to find the right spot in 2022 to right click to show all the options. So I'm gonna avoid the books advice a little bit and I'll show you another way. If you go into your tool palettes and you go to this gearbox, if you're in for the properties of the tool palettes, you can turn off the ones you want. You can import custom ones. Uh, the civil imperial sub assemblies, this one right here is plenty fine. And this will have what you need and we're in it right now. Uh, it only opens up just what I need if I switch to these. It goes to certain, a different tool palette. There's, this is a little more advanced, but if I go to this little cog here and multi-view blocks, it does just multi-view blocks only. Let's go to Civil Imperial Subassemblies and it'll take a minute. These are the basic home hitting ones. I got my main assemblies here, corridors, basic stuff. Lanes of roads, shoulders of roads, medians of roads, curbs of different types, daylights, which get pretty complicated, how you reconnect back to the earth in different ways or tell it how to make earth work in different ways from the edge of your assembly and other various things. So we're going to go just to the basic tool palette here. So the basic tool palette, at least in 2022, it looks a lot like this. You have basic variety of civil 3D features for assemblies like a basic lane and basic curves and shoulders of roads we're going to just pick basic lane and i had picked so remember i was in tools palettes i had picked it left click picked into this window my icon is ready to pick on something it's asking me marker point within an assembly or insert attached to one we're not going to use these right now we're going to physically pick on this assembly and we're going to pick near the midpoint, like so. Okay, we added a lane to a subassembly to our assembly. Um, in the properties window, let's hit escape. Let's pick on the lane, and we're going to look at its properties. Here's a subassembly and its properties. It's all it's called basic lane. Of course, you can rename it. We'll leave that for now. We're going to verify a few things. We're going to verify the side is set to the right, and it is. It's the right side, it says that correctly. And then click the marker of the midpoint is sub assembly. Excuse me with that. Let's just go to the next step, um, back to the basic tool palette. And we're gonna go to basic curb now. Left click it, and that's gonna engage it. Let's go to this window where I'm going to set it. I always pick the point where you want it to engage to. In this case, let's pick there. I have basic curb and gutter. This was just basic curb. I don't want that accident on that one. So let's go back to tool palette. Let's say basic curb with a gutter. Click that. Now click its base point. It should merge right there. Let's hit enter or escape. And now, Let's click the basic curb subassembly, or basic curb and gutter. Let's look at it. It says this is some assembly. Let's check its stats. The parameters are where you're going to change what, what the subassembly shape and points and links are doing, okay? And we're going to go into it, and we're going to say, I want the curb height to be right here, 0.5. You watch how it changes in my graphically. There it changed. 
So we change that to 0.5. And we're good on that. We'll go to step 11. We'll skip that step. It doesn't really uh, add too much. Uh, if we go into this, sub this assembly, we click it and we right click and we say assembly properties. We now have within it a baseline with the right side with sub assemblies. You can see them here and edit them here as well. Okay. You can tell them to turn on and off and various other advanced things. Hit cancel. Uh, we'll go into step 12. And it wants us to pick both sub assemblies. So I did it by going left direction, grab all. You can also use the, this direction, which you have to encompass everything. And I'm going to go to my area up here with sub assemblies selected. You have different contextual ribbon stuff. You can copy them somewhere or move them. I'm going to mirror them. I'm going to pick mirror. And it says select the marker with an assembly for the mirrored sub assemblies. So I'm going to pick this marker right there, the orange, and it mirrored them. So I have the matching properties of both sides. And that's the end of just doing a basic assembly quick with sub-assemblies for chapter one. Your completed one looks basically the same. Um, we'll move on to 9.2 now, making our first corridor. Now that we have one assembly, we can apply that assembly to our already existing alignment and profile. So this one, let's go into creating a corridor now. And on the home tab of the ribbon, so let's zoom out. We have this created where we left off. We'll go back to our ribbon home tab and we're going to go to corridor now. They're very easy to make, honestly. There's not much to them. They're just a matter of combining alignment profile assembly together now. We'll say that to create corridor. There's just a few things to add because we've got to tell them what to do. So we're going to make our first corridor for a long road Jordan cord in this development. We'll call it basic. And for the profile, we've got to select what we want. This is new here for 2022 or a newer CAD, but we'll leave this as is because we want the alignment and profile to make our corridor, not feature lines. This is a new feature. Uh, we'll say Jordan cord is our alignment of choice. Jordan cord FGCL, finished grade center line, is our profile, our vertical of choice okay so those two things combined are our, our backbone of our corridor then we'll say i want this subdivision row remember we just made that that's this bad boy here this assembly to be my assembly my perpendicular cross-sectional data along the corridor and we will get that going really it doesn't have you do this but i probably would say target a surface uh, to go to but we won't worry about that now we'll hit okay and we have a assembly almost made. We don't, we're not adding any baseline parameters. We'll just hit OK. We'll rebuild the corridor. Give it a second. It built our first corridor. You can see it appear in pink here. When I hover on it, it also appears in the 3D view. This 3D view is very handy here. You can see our alignment, or excuse me, our corridor is following a certain amount of intervals along this 3D chain, which follows this alignment in the horizontal and this profile in the vertical follows that chain of events. So that's the end of 9.2. We're going to go on to or the, the beginning of 9.2, but we're going to add some more complex features to apply some targets and understanding surface targets um, in corridors. So let's talk about that for a minute first, a few pages in. Here is our sub-assembly I was talking about earlier, how they're made of points, which link together, and links, which make an overall shape. And these all come together to multiple codes to create a code set style, how it looks all together. So we're going to start by applying corridor targets. So one thing that makes the corridors powerful, like it says here, is how they interact with other objects in the drawing, so how they can target things in the horizontal or the vertical, so we can have our corridors target the surface uh, to morph themselves into different shapes and sizes to go to existing surface. Uh, that is one very common item. And we're going to talk about that here on 177. Surface targets are very common in industry where a corridor basically interacts with a live surface underneath and it targets the outer edge here like this 
Remember we made this assembly of this nature? We didn't add the, the daylights, but we were about to. This would this subassembly of the assembly would target down to this flat existing ground surface, ending where what is called a daylight point or a point of daylight where it hits the surface, where it interact when it intersects. And you can take that and move it along different parts of this surface where it isn't flat like this, and this would this three to one slope might be five to one or or four to one. A three to one slope, by the way, is three in the horizontal, one in the vertical. It's a civil 3D nomenclature or civil th nomenclature. Other industries talk about it differently. They might say that's really a 33% slope to some industries, but that's what this looks like. So we are targeting this surface with the outer subassembly. That is very common, and we're going to be doing that. It's, or also you could say this whole process is referred to as daylighting, where the corridor meets, say in this example, in another existing surface. That's this section of road goes down to daylight. It's the most common example of, of targeting with a corridor, but there's other examples we'll talk about at the end of this page with or offset targets. This target uses, it says this assembly has to shoot out to a certain width, for example. Uh, maybe a lane needs to get double the size just for a little area with parking. That is known as a target to offset to, the distance between a point and the center line, that's offset. So an example, an alignment could control the outside edge of a lane. So you can target a, an alignment you make just for an outside edge. It could have a variety of weird shapes and turns, bus, bus, excuse me, bus lane pullouts, bike lanes, all kinds of stuff that it targets. So here's a perfect example. I've done these on a lot of roads with the Forest Service. Uh, I have a polyline here. I target my corridor assembly to shoot out to. So the width of this road widens just for this little pullout area. Like if you're going on a scenic tour and you need a safe pullout area, that would be a perfect use of a target for width only. And you can also use it for width and height, but this would just broaden the lane and then it re daylights back into the existing surface from this wider lane. That's a very typical example of using uh, different features in a civil 3D drawing like polylines, feature lines, and other things as a offset target like this red line here. Understanding the slope and elevation targets, they're similar, but they're used to control the elevation of a corridor. So they can control the elevation, let's say, of a ditch you have on the outside to ensure that it, the corridor drains to a very specific point, regardless of the slope of the road next to it. Um, profiles, feature lines, survey figures, and 3D polylines can be used as this target, not polylines, because polylines, by definition, are only 2D lines with one elevation. These items I have hovered over here, profiles, feature lines, survey figures, and 3D polylines, all have elevations inside of them. So for this, a slope or elevation target, you need an entity with most per, per, preferably different elevations to target to. So you might say, I want to target, say this is a 3D polyline or a feature line. You say this slope, daylight needs to target this line first to form this ditch, and then it can daylight back up. Okay, it'll make, this will help be, make the backbone of this ditch to control the elevations of it, and then while daylighting back to the existing earth. So this is a perfect example, this picture here on page 179 on figure 910 of using a slope or elevation target on a corridor. This is a great example. So daylighting is very common in land development. It's one of the fundamental activities to change the shape of the land in your desired way from what you design and there's different ways with corridors to control what it goes to how far what slope and what you're using so the one of the last things to mention on page 180 target behavior so your sub assemblies are the are just as critical as anything to have targeting capabilities so there's so many sub assemblies in the tool area you can use it's nice when there's been a cab manager or someone more experienced to give you good ones to start with instead of starting from scratch like we just did in 9.1. But uh, some subassemblies can target things, some can't. So a basic lane subassembly, for example, this subassembly 
isn't made to target anything. It's made to show a profile, a definition of a road lane. It is not meant to target out to any width or surfaces necessarily the same way that a daylight subassembly would. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. We're going to start with exercise 9.3. We're going to apply subassemblies that can use targets. So this is where we get some uh, more advanced skills with corridors. So let's start on page 180 in the third file, adding target subassemblies. We're going to go back to our tool palettes. And we have all of our different areas with subassemblies inside them and all these different categories like basic lanes, medians. Once again, if you forget how to turn this on, turn it on and off here. I have it docked to the right, so I'm turning it on and off as you can see over here. I'm going to turn it on and off, see? But I like leaving mine hidden to the side because I don't use them all the time. So we're going to go to basic tool palette once again. And we're just going to go to basic lane transition which is right here. It's called a simple transition lane that can tie to an alignment or a profile. Let me click it with the left data click. Let's hover out here, go into this window. Now we're in the upper right-hand window. We're going to click the right lane subassembly. We're going to click it and make sure I get this right. Basically it's saying to pick the upper right point of this curb and gutter. Let's give that a try. I just picked it. Right there, it popped the assembly in. Not necessarily sure if I wanted to do it like that. Let's, let me get ahead a little here. So I did miss one option. Very easy to miss this. Let's try that again. Not a bad thing to see necessarily. It overlaid my assembly on top of this curb. I didn't really want that. I wanted to replace this altogether. I missed that on step three. So let's try that again. Go to tool palettes. We'll do basic lane transition, pick it. Picking this dialog box. And now you can hit R for replace or you can pick it in the gray here. So pay attention to your command bar. Sometimes I fail to do this myself because I move in and out of CAD so quick. We want to really replace this assembly, not insert it. Um, by default, it will insert, insert it from what I can tell. Let's do replace. And we want to replace at this spot. So it replaced it. Let's do the same thing on this side. We're still adding the same one. We haven't hit escape or anything. And it still has replace going actively instead of inserting it. And we're going to pick, we wanted to pick at this point and it replaced it. So we basically have a road with two different assemblies there. Let's continue on. Let's take a look at the assembly vertical baseline. Let's select it like so. Let's look at our contextual ribbon and go to assembly properties this way up here, not the style, or you could right click and go in it this way as well, like many civil 3D objects. This dialog box comes up. We're gonna start by going to the construction tab and it shows us how to edit these. In this one, we're just going to rename some things. We're going to say, this is my right side, I know. By looking at this, if I go here, I can tell it's on the left. So we're going to call this right lane. We're going to call this right curb, and so on and so forth. Just naming and changing things in this area if we want. So we just renamed a few things. And now we're going to change some properties of one thing. So we did the same for the naming in A and B. We're going to click the right lane. We're going to change some properties it has. And under input values, we're going to scroll down to find transition type. We 
which I'm not necessarily seeing. Let's go back a couple steps to tool palettes again, and we're going into page 181 to 182. We're going to add another one, basic side slope cut ditch. We're going to bring it into this upper right side and saying to insert it by default, we want to insert. So we'll pick the insert point, this point in the top back of curbs subassembly, pick there. And we'll pick here for the left side curb. Insert, we'll hit escape. That's good. Now we have our daylights. Now you can change some properties of these daylights. I've picked this subassembly now. You can change its name here. You can also go into pick this subassembly and go into it here. You can go into it this way, and we can call it right daylight. We're not capitalized like that, no matter. Left daylight. A bunch of different options in here to change. We won't go into that now. Of those subassemblies, we'll hit OK. That's the end of that area. Um, we're going to start assigning targets within our subassembly, and that is on our next section, which gets advanced. It basically starts assigning these assemblies what they will target in our drawing. So let's go into applying corridor targets in the 9.4. And we're going to click the corridor on drawing. You can click it in any of these views that you can see. You can click it in this view. You can see a corridor is clicked. You can click it in this top view. Corridor is still clicked, okay. So click, right click, or left click, right click, and you can go to corridor properties this way, or in the book, they, you can go to it this way as well. Lots of different things with corridors up here. Corridor properties right here. Not styles, but properties. This is where we meat and potatoes of our corridors. We're gonna learn how to assign some targets. What things are assembly over here we'll be targeting like our other surfaces and various other things. We're going to go to one region. Um, we'll go to parameters. And actually, the book has us going in a little different way. So let's hit escape here. Let's go back here. And I have my quarter selected. Instead of going deep in the properties, that's one way to get to it. I was about to. That's the way I'm used to. We can edit targets this way. Hitting edit target. And it says select a region to edit. Well, click click inside the left viewport anywhere. So let's just click right here. It doesn't matter. This would take us to a certain area. It says, okay, what do we want to target? It's saying from station, this station to this station which is basically the end of this alignment, okay? We're just gonna say what we wanna target. So, under width and offset targets, where it says none, um, so next to the left lane assembly, we're gonna try one thing. And this is, gets pretty complex, so one step at a time. Instead of targeting alignment, we're going to say, I don't know, I want to target our feature line survey figures or poly. And then we're going to say select from drawing. And now we're going to pick. So remember alignments. This is the left side. This is the right side. As you go upstream in alignment, upwards in values, that's the that's how it dictates which direction is which. So this is left, this is right, if you're, if you're going in this direction, okay? So we're doing the left side offset. We're gonna pick this line, this object. Hit 
hit enter. It doesn't intuitively want to select it, so I had to hit enter. It did find it here. You're going to, you're going to want to see this something selected. In my case, it's a polyline. You're going to want to see that there. I'm going to hit OK. And let's return to the drawing by hitting OK one more time. My corridor updated. It widened. Use this as my left hand offset for widening my target. So we'll go back here, edit target. We went here after we selected the corridor, edit targets. We got to pick a region to edit. Let's just pick anywhere. And we just said, okay, yeah, here, only on the left lane, we wanted this to be targeted. So make sure you're in this left lane. Remember, we have three different types of targeting. So we have, we can target surfaces, we can target width offsets, mostly horizontal, but it holds. And we can target slope and elevation targets like that ditch on, on a picture on page, what was it? It was page 179. That was a very good one for this. So we have three different types of targeting options. We just did one. Hit OK there. Let's go to the next one. Uh, pick the corridor again. And let's do edit targets again. Pick in the screen somewhere here. Pick here. And this is the target mapping dialog box we just got back to. Let me do that again. That was a little confusing how I said it. So I have my, let's pick my, pick on my corridor. Wait till the contextual ribbon comes up. Let's say edit targets. Let's just pick anywhere on the corridor for now to say what region we want to work in. It doesn't matter at this point. That's how you get really surgical. Here's your target mapping dialog box. Now we're going to select the cell next to surfaces that says click here to set all. We're going to set it all to EG. We want our whole corridor outer edge to target the surface. I'm going to hit OK. And now our outer edge of our corridor and that region is targeting our surface. But really, we only have one region, so it's doing it all along the corridor. So these, this is where these subassemblies are getting to work. They are now targeting down to my existing surface. These subassemblies are working to go either up, up in a cut slope scenario or down in a fill slope added material needed scenario. So that's what we just did there. So we can really look at it in 3D here. We can see it goes down. I'm going to orbit really carefully and pan. And this cuts down to the earth here. We have a little ditch there. And this is our corridor, especially on this turn, which is if we go to our left box, that's where this is. You can see this is a, in a fill slope scenario. It's filling down to the existing earth. We have to bring in earth to fill this up, to embank it, to make an embankment slope. Um, in other spots, it has to cut back up, like right here. That's a cut slope or a cut scenario where we have to cut into the existing earth, not fill. This is a fill or embankment scenario. We have to add earth to make our design. So we can see our road in 3D here. Very cool. This is where all of our stuff starting to come together. So our last thing in this chapter on page 185, we're going to make a corridor surface. So one of the main things we're going to do in this chapter is make surfaces so we can display contours, designs, profiles, and stuff. So this now what we have made here, we can make a quick surface of this design surface, which is a big deal. So Going on to page 186, we're going to start by talking about cut and fill, which I've been talking about already, which is very important terms. So cut and fill are used a lot when land development or civil engineering in general or in surveying. And the word cut, as it says I've been repeating, refers to a condition where the road is below the existing ground or existing conditions, therefore has to project a slope in the upward direction in order to daylight. So we need to cut into the earth to pull it off. So the earth must be cut away in order to construct the road in that area. The opposite of that is fill, which refers to conditions where the area must be filled 
and were the earth to create that feature word one design. So cunt and fill can, can be referred to together as quantities of earth, where cut represents a volume of earth that must be removed. This is very critical to build something, and fill represents a volume of earth that must be brought in, into the site, import, infill, to build something. So corridor surface help us helps us really quickly see cuts and fills in active live times. That's a huge benefit of making a corridor surface and getting accurate cuts and fills of designing roads, canals, railways, and pipe networks and various other things. So they're all integrated together so they can automatically update and interactively work with each other as we've se seen as we've built and edited corridors. So we're going to make a surface now in 9.5. So go on to page 186 and start following along. And we're going to go into our final drawing of this chapter, creating a corridor surface. And we're going to click the Jordan Court Corridor. And then click the corridor surfaces on the ribbon, which there's other ways to get to this too. So we have a lot of stuff in here. You can also go in properties into corridor properties and wait until that opens up. We have a lot of these various things in here that you also see in the ribbon up here. We have surfaces. We're going to get to this area, but you can also get to it directly quickly by clicking the corridor, saying exactly what you want to do with the set corridor. You click your noun, get your verbs. Um, that's the beauty of these contextual ribbons. You can see things more visually. We'll go to corridor surfaces. This exact dialog box opens up and only these tabs, not everything of a corridor like we just saw. And we're gonna to go to the leftmost icon to create a new corridor surface. It's right here. Select it. It populates here. And we're gonna edit the name of the surface here by expanding this to the right. We're gonna call it FG. And this we got to get a data type that's set to the links and the code inside of the corridor. So the links that and the codes that work together, which ones do we want? Which codes? So the top would be the very top, the finished grade. We can have different datums of our surface underneath. In this case, we're just going to leave it top because we want the very top of our surface. That would be like saying we want everything that's on the very top of this. So where the very top of the surface really will truly be not this sub-datum area that would be, say, below here, the, below the asphalt. A little confusing. I won't go into detail, but we'll hit the plus sign to get that. That adds that type of surface. And then we're good. We'll hit OK. Rebuild the corridor. Say OK to that. And we made a surface. So our surface is a little gnarly. Um, and we're going to do a quick technique with it. So we made our surface, we click on it. It's a tin triangular regular network surface of this corridor we made. It really shoots out and triangulates across, which is what it was supposed to do there. We're gonna do one trick in here by to shrink wrap it down quickly. There's many methods to do this, but we're gonna do one. So with the cor corridor no longer selected, let's click the corridor in the drawing again, any way you can. I usually click what's most visible and easy. Click the corridor. And we're going to go back to corridor surfaces dialog box again. I'm going to click it. And we're going to go to boundaries this time, the boundaries tab. We're going to click Jordan Court. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say corridor extents as outer boundary. So make sure you get the right click. This is a little bit weird. We can add other things within it. But I'm going to say corridor extents. We want this to show. Apply. Rebuild corridor. Things get rebuilt. It sucks into the outer edge. There we go. We have a clean corridor surface now that goes to the extents. So it shrink wrapped it down. And as you can see in the top view, it did as well. So we have our contours of our new road. And that's our corridor extents. So that is the end of this chapter, more or less. But uh, one of the most critical areas of uh, this design is if you go to page 188, it talks a little bit more about corridor surfaces. So this is a little beyond the scope of this class, but it's saying in a corridor, you have many different datums within a surface. So different 
subsurfaces within a surface, those are very important. So if you do design, uh, datum code, for example, is used to represent links so the underside of materials that make up the road. This could be the road bed where you start building on that must be ex excavated or built on top of to accept road materials such as stone, concrete, asphalt. So sometimes you need to use corridor surfaces to make a subgrade surface or a surface below the top. That's where you would start uh, adding your building materials like, like they say here, stone, concrete, asphalt, and such on top of. So those can be very important subsurfaces you make a lot of times in civil engineering or designing. So you know if you have the right cut and fill for an area where you would start bringing these foreign materials in and laying and building on top of it. So it, you, a lot of those subsurfaces of corridors can help you establish um, your backbone of what you build on. So a little more deep in the corridors, we have a program feature that came in 2016 around that time and still being used, our intersections. So it's a wizard of merging different corridors into each other with intersections, which we won't do much in this class, but it, this picture is really good on 189 showing a crown road maintaining its crown through an intersection and the other side roads slope down. And here's another intersection corridor type where two corridors would meet and both crowns are maintained. So see how it slopes down here and here on both roads intersecting? These are just added tools in Civil 3D called the intersection tool. You can do different crown type roads. You need a lot of dialed in alignments and profiles to link to. And here's one of the dialog boxes where you basically merge two alignments at a very specific station with a very specific center for in this case, finished grade centerline profiles, and it, you can do a variety of things to merge the two corridors crossing each other in what's called an intersection. This is a very good visual of two different methods of attaining that and various regions where you would link the corridors and where they mesh together. They get very difficult. They're a more advanced topic, but it's a very good feature to merge an inter uh, corridor with another corridor. So where this corridor meets here, and it runs into this corridor running this direction. That would be an intersection tool. So by the end of this chapter, you have the baselines to start learning that, but we're not gonna do those in this chapter. They are on the home tab, creating intersections up here, and you need various things inside your drawing, preferably um, two corridors that would meet in a given area. So you would maybe do an intersection where Madison Lane meets Jordan Court here, or you might manually grade it out. But those are a tool that allow you to basically um, merge corridors. So that is the end of chapter nine. We'll move on to chapter 10 soon.